be a bit tolerant because um, I'm not yet used to Jeremy's um, maps aside from this. Well, I can't actually see that screen, so it's a little bit messy. I've actually lost the mouse now. Back. So I was going to start. So what I'm going to talk about is really not get too complicated, but to talk about what the sort of R code that I write, what it looks like and what it feels like, um, and really that I'm a, I'm a very vanilla person, okay, I use things in a fairly simple fashion, as you will see, um, so I thought I'd explain my basic philosophy. Um, you know how this, uh, people are right first time? Yeah? I have a less aggressive philosophy. I reckon I can be right by about the third time. Okay? <laughs> and particularly in writing R, I always try to write something, modify it a little, and then usually by the third time I reckon I've got something that's reasonable. Okay? I also, when I'm writing stuff, always assume that people's priorities are going to change, the problem's going to change, and that certainly the data will change. When somebody gives you data, they always come back and say, oh, sorry, it really should be like this, or can you do something else? And when I use LaTeX, um, I tend to use LaTeX in a very um, simple manner as well. Right? Lots of people use LaTeX with up to a million packages. I tend to use it in a very simple fashion. So I'll be talking about the link to LaTeX later, but um, only in a very simple way. And so my, my real goal um, when I write code is I always hope to be able to read some of my old code <coughs> and remember how to use it, <coughs> remember what it did, be able to change it a little bit so that it does something slightly different from last time, and most importantly, to have confidence that it is actually doing something sensible. Okay? I hate having code when I look at it and I think, oh, can I trust it? Okay? So you'll find that's part of the reason why I write in what really is a fairly simple sort of manner that I think we should all find easy to read. So the structure of the talk is we've got six examples, we're going through them, in each case I'll show you a portion of the code, we'll explain a feature, and then we get to ask questions until somebody says, well look, let's go on now, right? So that's the sort of structure. So my first example is to do with just how do you go about writing a function at all in a simple function and the sort of questions that occur to me, um, what do I want it to do? What do I want returned from this function? Um, and when should it fail? Because you know, often you think it's going to do something, but from time to time you give it an object, give it some arguments that actually don't satisfy the assumptions. So it's usually a good idea to check. Sometimes you need to ask the rather complicated and very R-oriented question, does it work for vector arguments? Now, that's a question that wouldn't be the same in some other programming language. Because quite often in other programming languages, when you give a function, you're expecting scalars as the arguments. Whereas in R, by default, it takes vectors as arguments. And sometimes we write functions that actually only work for scalars. But you have to ask yourself, do you really want it to work for vectors? Because R, you know, R's all about getting things to work for vectors, I think. How can you be sure that it's correct? And that means keeping the testing code. Now, one of my pet things there, um, like most good ideas, it wasn't mine, is that after the function, you write that really great code, if, false, and open a squiggly bracket, and you put some stuff in a squiggly bracket, which, because it's inside if false, it doesn't get executed. So if you just source this file, nothing happens. And in that spot, you put your test code. So whenever you want to come back to it later and test that it still works, there's your test code right next to the function in a very simple way. Um, the last ones I'll talk about later now. Let's just try and get to this R code. Now you have to be a bit tolerant here because my screen doesn't show this. So I have to run it from looking over there. Oh, this is sort of part of my style. You know, I knew I was going to give this to Jeremy, he was going to give the other one. 
So I, I banged Jeremy's details on the top of my R file so that if I had any questions while I was doing it, I didn't have to look up his telephone number somewhere else, it was there. Um, and um, so that's sort of some of its instructions to myself. Um, now, here's an example of some functions. What the problem here is I was an analyzing some code from an aluminium pot line. Okay, so this is where you smelt aluminium. You put a lot of electricity in and you get a little bit of aluminium out and you monitor the voltage and the amperage and not much else actually. And I wanted to be able to draw some graphs of this data, particularly voltage data. Now sometimes the scale might be such that I was showing only two seconds of data. Sometimes I might be showing an hour's data. And so I wanted a little function that would label the time axis for me. Okay? And it would label it sensibly whether I had two, two seconds, five minutes, or an hour. Okay? And so here's the, the code. Like everything, this is, this is what I would have written if I'd been clever, you see. So this is after I've refined it several times, and this is what worked. So I'm writing a function that's called label time axis. Okay? It's a function that takes no arguments which is really good, so just say you want your time axis label. And how does it work? Well, it calls the standard function par, which you've probably all used for graphics, and that returns all of the parameters of your current plot. So this function is only to be called when you've already got a plot there. So th this gets all the functions of the plot. USR gets the user specification of the range of the x and y. And so I store those in user. And then I've got x dot min is the first of that first component of that thing, and x dot max is the second component. So that says the x-axis goes from here to here. And of course, I, this is a time axis, so you know, that might be two seconds or it might be three thousand seconds. Um, and so I've said the x range in seconds is the difference between these. If the range is less than three seconds, um, I've printed a message. Is this legible from all this? Legible enough? Anyway, so it, it wouldn't hurt because I, I think it's. Is it, is it? Pretty hard to see. Pretty hard to see. Right? I don't really want to bother too much about all the details of these, but the thing is I've got a function that looks up the par to find the range of the x-axis, and then it labels the axis in whatever way I think was appropriate. So this is a function that I wrote by trial and error, if you like. I, I've, I did something that seemed to work when the scale of the x-axis was only three or four seconds, something that worked when it was several minutes, and so on. Um, and I found I needed some standard things. So the, the, these are some of the labels that I might use um, if I'm labeling in half hours or minutes or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, I've got a, I've got a function label time axis, okay? which in this case doesn't do any computing. Um, usually when we do write a function, it's usually to do some computing. But in this case, it's a function that's just to add something to a graph, and if I just push down, um, 
I then write a little function called axes. So this is for a plot. And what axes does is it calls my function label time axis and uses the standard ways to draw a box and to draw the, the y axis. Okay? So I've got a slightly more complicated function that uses the first function. And then um, I had a function screen heading which is just so that sometimes I wanted a title on the, on the plot and sometimes I didn't. So I had my own screen heading function which if titles was required, and now that's a, a local variable, it'll put a title and if not it won't do anything. And similarly, um, if, if you're running a pot line, an aluminium pot line, from time to time you put a bit of extra alumina in. And on my graph, as well as showing the time and showing the voltage on the, x, on the y axis, I wanted to put some marks whenever this particular cell that had some alumina added. And so I wrote a little function, show feed times, which just puts some marks, doesn't have to matter what. And similarly, there's a function show bridge moves, because another thing that happens with an aluminium pot line is from time to time they move the um, great big bits of copper, uh, the carbon anodes, they move them down into the bath a little bit or move them up a little bit. And I wanted on my graph to be able to show when the bridge moves were made so that I could look at that and look at the voltage at the same time. And so I wrote a little function, um, which in this case was rather more complicated. And I also, they had a resistance target for this cell. So this was another thing that made sense for this particular application. So I had another little function to show the resistance target for the cell. And so at the end of the day, um, I'm able to, um, here's, this is just generating some random numbers pretty much. Um, but if I go through, that's drawing um, some numbers and you can see it's labelled on this axis the time. So this was at 11 hours 40 minutes and no seconds. And this is 11 hours 40 minutes and 10 seconds. So in that case, the time axis is only 50 seconds long. There's a voltage on the uh, y axis. And um, here's another one where that goes from 11.40 till 1 o'clock. So in this case, the time axis is 1 hour and 20 minutes long. Um, and this is another case. So that's 12 hours of data. And in a sense, that's meant to, my, my reason for putting these together, that's an example of what I think is a sensible use of functions, where you've got some fairly well-defined jobs that you want done, and you just write a function for each job. I usually do them for computational jobs, but in this case I did them for a whole lot of graphic jobs. As, a, as another illustration, um, to illustrate a few other slightly different things, I was playing around with Fisher's exact test. Now, I don't know how, how statistical you are, but anyway, I, I, I wanted to check the, some code I was doing for something about Fisher's exact test would do the right thing. And so this was to illustrate a way to write a function. Now, this is what I often do. I wanted F exact props, because I was computing a whole list of probabilities for this. This was a function of some frequencies, because Fisher's exact test is to do with a two by two table, and so you've got a two by two array of frequencies. So this is going to have four numbers in a two by two table. And my function initially is just browser and close. Okay, so I can you know, run that function, no trouble. And I then set up a typical um, 
set of data that might be used by this function. In this case, it's the numbers 4, 1, 1, 2 in a matrix. And then I call the function f exact props with this data. Um, and what it does. Can't find your mouse again. Where? Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Um, the trouble is, it's over there. Oh, I have to bring it over here. <laughs> function, give, give sample data, and then do that, um, you can't see it. But anyway, you're now in the browser in this function. Um, and what you can do is just play around, work out what you need to do, do the commands on this thing, and at the end of the day you've written the function for your sample data. Um, just by, um, and so you type commands in here, and then after you've got it to work, you get rid of the browser command, and lo and behold, you've written a function. Um, now I find that quite good. I, I, I actually do use it myself, and I also quite often use it when I'm showing somebody how to write an R function. Can you recall the code without copying and pasting? Well, I actually typed the code in here. Um, no, you know, you know, I don't use anything clever. I actually type the code in the function. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, you know, in here you've actually got something called FREQ. I, alternatively, you can just work it out and then copy the code in later. Um, but sometimes that's a convenient way to write a new function. And I, I ended up. Oh, sorry, I have to play after now. I ended up, I wrote this function. We're not going to worry too much about the, you know, I ended up, I worked out some row totals, some column totals, and did, <coughs> did some things that I needed to compute all the probabilities for all the possible outcomes for that two by two table. And here's an example of um, my test code. So here I've written, you know, if false, so that this stuff isn't normally executed. But what I've done is I've set up a set of frequencies, I've called my new function, and I've then called the standard function fisher.test to see what it gets, and compared my answers to the standard function. So that if I came back to this function tomorrow, and I thought, oh, you know, is this really getting the right answer? I can see how I compared it. And I can even change the example if I want to. Um, and I can, again, compare my function to the standard one. I, m mine produces a slightly different set of outputs, but some of it's comparable. But the, the point I wanted to make is just that it's um, a good practice, I think, to store your test code. Because most of us, when we write a function in the first place, we do actually do some testing. I find that to be a convenient way to store the test code right next to the function. And because it's in this if false bracket, when you source the file that has that function, it doesn't run the test code, it doesn't get in the way, it just sits there if when you want it. What's the browser? Oh, browser, when you hit browser, it calls for commands from the keyboard. And that's really nice because you can interrogate what's the value of something. People often use it for debugging. Okay? So if you've got some, some code, for instance, if you've got a loop, 
that you've written, and it doesn't work, what you can do is put browser in the middle, in the middle of a loop, and every time it goes around the loop, it will stop at this browser. And you can type commands like give the name of something and it'll print its value. And so you can have a look to see what's going on. Okay? And in more complicated cases, you can do things. Suppose you've got a big loop, you know, a thousand times <coughs> over, and it goes wrong at number 793. You can also write if i equals 793, browser. Okay, and it'll then go around your loop 792 times, and on the 793rd one, it'll stop, and you can interrogate what are the values of all these variables. So do you just do an ls when you're inside the browser? You can do ls what? inside the browser to see what, what variables are there. Um, you can also you know, try a slightly different version of one of your commands or whatever. It's very useful. Um, and the way I Hitting um, enter gets you past the browser, and capital Q quits, and they're the main ones. And the other one that's really bad is that N does next in some sense. I've forgotten what, what, but it really annoys me because I often use N as a variable, and you go and print N, and it does something else. But anyway, but you can always. I, like most people, I don't remember all this stuff. I just look up the online manual whenever I need something. But yeah, the browser is a really useful thing yeah, in a lot of purposes, in a lot of cases. And I often use it on that situation. examples illustrate that. I know I just want to talk to this last point here. One of the things that's really great about writing functions in R is that if you've written a function and you then realise you want to do something a little bit more complicated, one of the things that you can do is you can add another parameter to the, to the function. And if, and if it, this new parameter, you know, say it was usually zero, <laughs> Um, and, and you know, you'd written the function as if it was a zero, and you realise that you actually want to take care of the case where, when it's non-zero as well, then you can add to your parameter list, you know, comma, new param equals zero, and when you do that, if this new parameter isn't specified, the default of zero will be taken. Okay? And if, if you add a new parameter to, to a function in that way, then it, the if the function worked before, it will still work, even though it's a new function with an extra parameter, because for this new parameter, it has a default, and so it should still work. And so quite often, um, the way you end up writing complicated functions is you start off with something that does the basic case, and then you add a parameter to that you know, is non-zero or something in, the, in, in a more complicated case, and then you extend the code in your function to make sure you take care of the other cases. The next example, so the, now that's, that, that was an example just to illustrate writing some simple functions. This now is an example to talk about a typical um, consulting report where somebody's, in my case, I've got some data to do with something somebody wants me to do some stuff and write a report about it. Okay? It's a fairly common task that people who use R want to do. Um, now, the sort of things I do, um, some of the main features there, when I'm writing a report, I normally decide on a nice standard format or a few standard formats. Okay? For a really complicated report, I will sometimes have, might be a two column Report. I might have a one column figure and a two column figure that's bigger and perhaps also a square figure because sometimes you want a figure where the two axes are sort of equivalent so you want a square figure whereas you, most figures are sort of um, not as high as they are wide but, so I might have three standard formats say so I set those up 
another important issue uh, in the way I work is I never change data on the raw data files. If somebody sends me some data, I never touch it. Okay? I write some R commands to patch up the errors, which you know, usually means replace with NAs all the stuff I don't like or whatever. But anyway, I never touch the data, I write the commands to patch it up. And then when the person comes back and says, oh sorry, that wasn't the right data or I've got some extra or something, you tell them how difficult it's going to be and charge them an extra whole heap of money <laughs> and all sorts of stuff and you whinge something awful. You then go back to your R code and you just run it again. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, if you've done some graphics to check, you, you run your graphs to check and you often got some commands to get rid of bad data and replace it with NAs or some other stuff. And you might need a little bit of extra data, but usually it's actually not that hard to run with somebody's corrected set of data. But don't ever tell them that, okay? Always claim that it's really difficult and that they owe you a favour, okay? But you should always organise your R in expectation that people will do this. My, I, I usually save graphs, um, I don't know why, I, 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 I have a command to file that I always define. Okay, which just means I'd like this graph written to a file. And in my commands for doing a job, there'll be lots of graphs that I'm not writing to a file, but the ones that form part of the report, I'll have this to file command underneath them to write a, you know, a PDF or a um, PNG or whatever sort of file you want. Um, and I'll put that there. And in, in the LaTeX thing, um, I'm very fond of the LaTeX command backslash R code of one argument that does nothing no matter what the argument is. Okay? Which means you can put your R code inside your LaTeX and it doesn't interfere with your LaTeX. Okay? It's just sitting there inside the source of your report, the, the R that you use to check something. Okay? And it's just sitting there inside the report and doesn't get lost. I, I often use a, a um, for the actual figures, I have sort of standardised on this one, a, a command in LaTeX figure which takes two arguments, one of which is the name of the file that's going to have this graph on, and the other one is the caption, which is you know, a fairly natural thing to do. And that means I don't have to think about anything when I'm typing, I just say backslash figure, give its name, and an approximate caption. And I don't even think about it. And that, that works for me. Now, to have a look at the example, um, So to illustrate some of these, here's some of my commands at the start for a really complicated report. Um, Graphics.off to get rid of any graphics windows that might have existed beforehand, just to clear up. Then um, here's, here's the command to start a, this is for a two column report, to have a one column graph <laughs> that doesn't have room for an X label underneath. So it just says, you know, windows, height of 1.9 inches, width of 3.1 inches, and point size of 8, which is quite small, but if you're doing a two-column report, you often are using fairly small font, so that works for me. <coughs> and then I've specified some standard parameters. Ma is the size of the margin around it, and MPG is the size, like, where you put the labels and the tick marks relative to the edge of a graph and how big the tick marks are to be. And then device three is for a similar graph but where I do want room for an X label. Device four, oh, sorry, device three was a square plot. Device four was where I had one column that I wanted an X label. Device five was where I had a big graph that I wanted to use two columns. And 
In this case, I have actually got device six, which is if I want to make a PowerPoint slide. So in the same um, uh, set of R commands, I might be wanting to write, uh, prepare some slides for a PowerPoint presentation. And so for PowerPoint, um, where does it say? Yeah. Must be further down. This is defining the standard CSIRO colours. Like lots of places, people like you to use the standard format. So I've you know, found out what the standard colours were and defined them. Okay, so for PowerPoint size, like I use height is 7, width is 10, and point size 16, and these other things. So I've worked out what works for me such that when I import that into PowerPoint, I don't have to do any changing size. Okay? That also means that if you've got several PowerPoint slides, they all line up if they, want, if they need to line up one to the next one. Okay, and then, so the sort of thing I need to do then, I either say writing figures is false if I'm just playing around, or I might say true if I want to write them out. And in this case, my to file command, this is if I want one, it says if I'm writing figures, I save, save the plot. So save plot is a standard uh, command. And I use type WMF, Windows Metafont, if, it's, if I'm writing to number six, because that's for PowerPoint. And in this case, I'm using EPS, encapsulated postscript, for all of the other sorts. Okay? But of course, if I change my mind and I might want to use PDF, I only have to change it at one place. Okay, and then I get a complete set of PDFs from my entire um, analysis. <coughs> and so this now is what my typical thing looks like. I won't run it today because they're getting complicated enough already. But typical sort of thing to me is you're reading the data. Data is um, read CSV. I think most people end up, uh, using, end up using CSV files for lots of things. The, the real advantage of CSV files is that all the horrible people in the universe who want to use Excel are fairly happy that they double click on a CSV file and they feel as if they know what it's there because it opens in Excel. Um, but it's actually a good friendly, friendly thing that you can open in vast numbers of other, other software as well. So you read it in. Uh, normally you ask dim of data just to find out how many rows and how many columns. You know, data of one comma to get the first row is nearly always a very useful thing just to have a look at the first record. Sometimes I look at the last record. Um, in this case, this was some data on um, a wind generator. And so, um, now I, I renamed some of these things to the, 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 the amount of energy from the winds in. Oh, this was a state of storage of some battery system and the power out of the battery. And the typical sort of running there's some commands for checking the reasonableness of the data. So here I just plotted some stuff to check that it made sense. And in this case, this, this is typical, you know, overwrite or omit any dubious data. So here, um, for some reason or another, there was a column five in this data that was an un a load of absolute rubbish. Uh, that was because when I got the CSV file out of the Excel file, <laughs> I hadn't tidied it up properly and it thought it had five columns. So it had the four I wanted and one that was absolute garbage. Yep, thank you. But if you like. Um, now, to illustrate um, my use of all of these um, windows, So here, um, I'm just getting some X's and some Y's. I'm saying I'd like device number four, which was a small plot. Um, oh, I haven't actually executed all the other stuff. Sorry, I should illustrate that. Do you need to get out of it? No, this is, this is really good. So graphics.op gets rid of anything. Um,
sorry, this is uh, causing the next here. Um, so you can see it's created a window up there. Um, if I just, um, I'll just do all of them at once. And that just creates all of those, um, which um, so that big one's my one for making um, ones for PowerPoint, and the others are sitting around the place. And so while I'm playing around with the R, I'll write to whichever of those graphics windows I want, so that I'm writing graphs that are about the right size for my my purpose. The next example I wanted to mention is an entirely different style of using R. Um, sometimes you can use it for algorithm development when you want to you know, copy something. In, in my case, this was copying some code out of the journal paper to, to check that it was, you know, I wanted to do something um, with this. And so what I wanted was some code that I knew was correct because it was exactly like it said in the journal. And I was then going to write some C code that did a special case of this and did it quick. But I wanted something that was um, really reliable because it was um, exactly the same as, as, in the, in, um, as in the journal. Now I'm going to this here. Let's see. So this was for, for Kelvin filtering. So I looked up a paper, a, a, a paper on Kelvin filtering, uh, Koopman and Durbin, 2000. The title, the journal name, yes, that's all there. Been good work. Um, and anyway, I actually had a list <coughs> uh, um, for each of the things. You know, so they had a variable called V, and I was going to make a list of all the Vs so that within the, the loop, that, that it was V sub I, I was storing all of these in a list so that I actually had all the intermediates stored. Some, some of these things are matrices and some of them are scalars, some of them are vectors, but I put them all in lists and I've used exactly the same nomenclature as in the, um, in the, in the paper so that, you know, that this is it you get through there and then V is Y minus Z vector matrix time, matrix multiplication times A, etc. Um, I, this code I wouldn't expect you to have any particular interest in, but the idea is... Um, Jeff, what, what is that assignment notation? Oh, this, this assignment notation, yeah, the, the double thing yeah. there, that saves it as a global variable rather than as a local variable. Mm -hmm. It's not recommended, really, <laughs> um, because you can get into a bit of trouble with it. But in this case, I just wanted something that worked, and so I was actually just saving these globally. So all of the intermediate calculations were available to me. Yeah, I, I wouldn't particularly recommend that. Um, it's much better, really, that within a function you use local variables. But in this case, I wasn't concerned about anything other than making sure that I was getting the right answers. And so I was storing all intermediates, I was storing all those global variables, so that after I'd executed this code, I had access to everything. So that then when I tried to write my other code, I could compare it to this. And that, that's a sort of style of using R that I find occasionally quite useful. And it's quite different from most of the other things I use. I might just, uh, given all the difficulty of fiddling around, I might just stay here. <laughs> but having talked about that to write the global, a much better style, which is definitely recommended, is having a named environment for variables that you want to share between a set of functions. Okay, now, 
How many people actually use environments in which to today? No? Occasionally. Anyway. So on a lot of other languages, you talk about the scope of variables, where you know, some things are known in this bit of code, but they're not known out here. Now, you can, in fact, in R, um, specify an environment. And that means that you can say that when a function tries to look for the, to see if it's got a variable of that name, it looks in that environment. And that's really good, because it stops, stops things from getting confused with global variables. Because one of the things where R can go badly wrong when you write a lot of code is that you don't realise that you've used the same variable name here as you've used over there in that code you wrote two weeks ago, and they end up getting in each other's way. Now, that shouldn't happen if you only use local variables, but sometimes you make use of global variables, and when that happens, you, you can find yourself um, finding it very difficult to find what's gone wrong. Now, here's a little example where I had a, um, I'd made use of an environment. In this case, I was playing around with permutations. So I was looking at some job scheduling code where you might want to put the jobs on some machine in any of several orders. And I, I wanted some operations on permutations. So I defined a new environment to be permutation numbers. So this is. Really, really it's, it's a set of variables. I haven't said what's in there yet, but I'm, I'm going to store stuff in permutation numbers so that it's not actually global variables, but it can be shared between functions. So my first one was to set it up, and you had to tell it how many things you want to be permuted. And so it worked out a whole lot of stuff, like how many different permutations that there are, and a whole lot. Yeah, various other stuff, it doesn't really matter. But the thing like, and you, when you want to store it in permutation, you have to say permutation numbers dollar n objects is n. And that means that it's storing this thing not in a local variable called n objects and not in a global variable called n objects, but in a variable inside this environment called permutation numbers. <coughs> Is it like namespaces? It's, it's a namespace. Yeah, it's a namespace. Exactly. Yep, okay. I'll just finish this and then we'll go. Yep. Um, and so that's quite good. Now, at, at the end of that function, you have to say that the environment for this function is the named environment, so that you, that function knows that when it looks for something, it should look to see if there's a local variable by that name. Then it should look to see if there's something in permutation numbers by that name. And that's what stops it getting confused. And so I then, you know, I had some other function, in this case a rather trivial one. Um, not that trivial. But yeah, so a function location that takes a permutation and does something to it. And I've told it that the environment of this function is permutation numbers. So again, that function knows to look in that particular you know, namespace environment called permutation numbers. And that, that tends to make your code more reliable because you're not looking up, you're not looking up global variables. You know, whenever you use global variables, there's, a, there's room for error. Because you've said that the environment for those functions in the first one is permutation numbers. Yes. Does that then mean you no longer need to write permutation numbers dollar inside? Oh, you have to write permutations dollar on the left hand side when you want to store it um, in permutation numbers. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because if you'd just written something, it would assume you were writing to a local variable. Right. And but on the right hand side. There's no way to kind of say the next few things, just assume everything's going to be stuck into no. that. No. On the right hand side, you can leave out the yeah, permutation no, numbers dollar. But on the left hand side, if you want to store it in there, you have to say. There's no way to step into a namespace and just assume that your No, because you see the function can still be using local variables as well as variables from that namespace. And in general, when you're writing a function, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, for I equals one to something or other, the I is still a local variable and you don't want I to be in the namespace, or it might mess up something else in that namespace. So 
in general, you do still want local variables, even when you are using some variables from the namespace. So, I would strongly recommend use of the namespace whenever you're writing complicated things. Can you put a function in an environment, in a namespace? Yes, yes, you can say, <coughs> yeah, anything, really. Um, in a sense, a function's only a lot of text anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so, so you put a function there so that it knows it's to use the function that's in that namespace, and that function is not known elsewhere. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever done it, but uh, it's, it's doable. So in this case, I wrote several um, functions that did that, uh, that used that namespace. Um, now, I just wanted to, uh, I've got a couple of examples we're not going to do now. I'll just finish off by, um, I had a couple of summary slides I wanted to do at the end. sort of reiterate my philosophy. Um, when I said write a third time, you know, I really mean it as a, a sensible attitude when you're writing R. Is, you know, don't expect to write good code. You know, you, you play around and you get something that works. But I do think you should actually go back and say, well, you know, I might want to reuse this code another time. So having written something, it's, it's often worthwhile to do a little bit of tidying up even if it's not really necessary for the current, current application because you're going to go and reuse your own code and sometimes somebody else will reuse your code as well. So it, it is worth that sort of third go. You know, first time you stuff it up, second time you get it to work, and third time you um, make it so that it's good enough to be reused. Always assume that things are going to get changed. Um, and when I, I talked about these things, hoping to be able to read, read old code so I could remember it, um, there's another test, of course, which is that other people should find it readable. And you really should try to write your code so that if somebody else picks it up, they've got half a chance of working out what it means. Another thing that's a bit of an issue is a lot of us um, don't show the way we code to other people. That's one of the reasons I like this sort of thing. You know, I think it's really good to show your programming style to other people, even if you're a bit ashamed of some bits of it. Um, you're usually proud of some of the bits, um, but the idea is that you should learn from other people's mistakes as well as from your own mistakes. Yeah, so that's my uh, philosophy. Okay, thank you. Jeremy, we're going to have a go. <laughs> um, obviously, we're running Behind, but uh, we actually got this place till eight, so there's no rush. Um, we're going to get hungry and tired, but um, <laughs> yeah, bear with us if you can, and um, try and we will try and ignore all the stomach noises. But um, yeah, don't rush, Jeremy. Um, the, the restaurant will wait for us.